Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. Let's do another really cool chess game, shall we? Alright, we're surviving because we're being intelligent and practice social distancing. I hope so, because if there is a second wave of COVID, it's going to be a rough one through the winter. So let's be wise. I know we've got to get the economy going, but we also need to be alive to have an economy, right? So this particular game, a really good game. Let me arrange my coat here. This is out of Gary Kosperoff's My Great Predecessor. This is part five on Viktor Korchnoi and Anatoly Karpov. He's got a uh, a game of Karpov that's just sensational. His historic notes and his setup in this is really superb. I'm not going to take the time to give you all the historical note at this point. This game was their ninth game. Now this is the candidates match. This is after, this is uh, Leningrad 1974. So this is after Fisher has beat Spassky for the world championship and he's disappeared. He hasn't played any chess at all. The candidates match went on anyway to see who was going to be able to challenge Fisher, giving him his first official chance to defend his championship, which we know never happened. In this candidate match is Karpov and Spassky. Karpov is white, Spassky is black. Now, the, uh, the commentators were all saying Spassky was going to take this. And Karpov blew everybody away when Spassky didn't. Very interesting situation. Spassky was considered the strongest candidate to go again against Fisher. Karpov had been upping through the ranks speedily. Uh, the, the comment in Kasparov, just to show you how serious Karpov was, uh, for four months he had studied 12 hours a day, seven days a week for this candidates match of however many games they had to play to see who would play against Fisher. Karpov really played exceptional chess. Uh, Spassky does the Sicilian here, the classic Sicilian. Karpov opens up with knight f3 and then e6, of course, and d4, yes, and the pawn will take the pawn, yes, and the knight will take the pawn, yes, and knight f6 comes out there winning, knight c3, so the knights are coming out, and now it's a small, firm, compact center. Uh, here in a little bit, Spassky had the chance to take it into the Shevingen variation, but he strategically really blew it. <laughs> and, and from that point on, it was a tough game for him. Bishop e2, Bishop e7, they're both doing fine at this point. They've both castled early, so they're in a good position typical position and he pushes Karpov goes ahead and pushes the f4 which means that they are contesting the e5 square. <clears throat> the e5 square is going to be the key square in this game, this one right here. The contest is for that square. And you remember some of my earlier videos I said an entire game can revolve around one square. Strategically if you control it or occupy it you can win. Let's watch. Very interesting how Karpov does this. Knight c6. Notice the single piece moves to getting out so that they can both be flexible enough to fight for the e5 square. There's no willy-nilly chess here. This is really excellent chess. Now The first one to move a piece twice is Karpov, but it's a valid move. He brings his knight to b3. He's going to 
rearrange some situations. Now, at this point, there's really nothing, there's no weaknesses in either side, right? Both positions are truly solid. There's no real, now, they want to prepare more to either, either for white or for black to control the e5. There's still a few more things they can do to prepare for that advance or attack or defense. However, they can manipulate this so that e5 falls into their control, which will give whoever controls it the initiative. And Spassky really pulls a loop. He really messes up. He pulls a strategic blunder, and that's what Kasparov said. And people gasped when he made that move. They go, what? So Spassky did not play this correct. Karpov, rather than letting Spassky have a wing attack... Now, the centers, uh, each center is firmly under control. I mean, no one's going to go marching through the center to attack the Castled King at this point. This position does not call for an attack on the Castled King at, in any manner at this point. We are still in the process of arranging and rearranging, which is Karpov is starting to do. You've got to rearrange it so that you can strategically use the e5 to attack the opponent's king. And this can go for either one, either side. Okay? Just so we understand that. This is just... However, <laughs> you know, chess, every rule is written to be broken, right? Nimzovich's idea is accurate in that when the center when you don't have an obvious breakthrough in the center, and neither one of these guys do, when you don't have an obvious central way to attack, which neither one of them does, then you fight on the wings. Look, that's valid chess. But Spassky did it wrong. He, here is where he made the mistake. He could have worked it into the Shevingen defense uh, if he had played a six instead. This is what Kasparov says. But instead, he really thrust the pawn out. He wanted to do a queenside attack, and it's just, it's just the wrong. True, he has a knight outpost, but it sincerely does not help him. Uh, those are two wasted moves in this game when the preparation needs to be more toward e5 for both sides. The first one to occupy or else control e5 really has the feather in the cap, so to speak. This does not help Spassky get the e5 control. Is the And, and Kasparov has all kinds of analysis here that take me an hour just to show you the variations. Just trust, if you can, get that book. It's a great book to study. So anyway, to make a long story short, uh, this just does not work. Now, because Spassky has made a rather lame attempt at a queenside, for one, it's only one peak. Drew, his bishops are pointing this direction, and his queen can jump here pretty easily, right? But that gives up the e5. Karpov's setup is such that Spassky just can't give up e5 and expect to win, even if he has a solid queenside attack, because the e5 is more strategic than a queenside attack for the simple reason that the setup was for e5, not a queenside attack. I know, I'm, I'm elaborating on this. You ought to see Kasparov elaborate. <laughs> it's pretty sensational. So I'm just giving you the, the nuts and bolts skinny of this. So, Karpov doesn't need to spend a lot of time worrying about defending his queen's side, right? Uh, technically speaking, that knight is not going to do a lot by itself, right? So, if you find yourself in this position, control it somewhat, keep your eye on it, but proceed to prepare for the e5, which is what Karpov does. 
bringing his bishop up. So Karpov is, he is getting the better rearrangement of his pieces in order to control e5, the Spassky is. That's the point here. And it is a really important point. Bishop c6. And at this point, this is ironic. And through a lot of analysis, Kasparov shows this. He has like three or four different variations, and every one of them have like 12, 13 moves. These guys can see that far ahead. I can't. I'm not going to go through the variations with you, but just understand this. At this point, because of the nature of his attempt here, his best chance now is to push the pawn to e5. Uh, he's not as re ready and prepared as he needs to be, but because of the way Kasparov has rearranged his pieces, Spassky is almost forced to do an early push of the e-pawn to give him any kind of a chance, and instead he went to here. Okay, That's the nutshell argument that Kasparov and uh, Botvinnik did a lot of analysis on this, the former world champion, and he also agreed with Kasparov when he said, yeah, now he should have pushed that pawn. Uh, he, he's going to sweat bullets here for a little while. He, he can pull it out if he plays right, but that was weak compared to the push of e65. And here's why. Knight d4. The centralization the prominent preparation now for that e5. And you say, it doesn't even support e5. It does, in an interesting way. He'll show you. For one thing, this knight is not a permanent outpost because this pawn can eventually push when this knight gets out of the way, right? So that knight can't be chased out. But Karpov's knight, if he lands here, that's an eternal outpost. And remember, what makes an eternal outpost? The definition is no pawns can chase him away. True, his piece can be exchanged if necessary. But the fight for e5 means you can't exchange too much, right? So that's the, the square that this move could be preparing for. And that makes Karpov's outpost stronger than Spassky's because in the future, Spassky could have to get rid of that outpost, right? So that's why, at this point, that's still a weaker move. It's what he's got, but it's a weaker move. Now, Spassky, with this move, is attempting... They're still looking at the e5. Yes? The idea here is if he pushes the f, he's trying to prevent the, the, the knight, eventually, from coming here or the bishop from getting in to wreak havoc on the king side, right? So this is a defensive maneuver. There's nothing wrong with it. But again, it does not advance the support for the e5. It, it's, uh, it's attempting to prevent a future excursion against the king side, but it doesn't focus on e5. Uh, Karpov's position is better for that at this point. Rook f2 and he gets an exclamation point. Here's why. We'll show you. Now he pushes the e5. Uh, Karpov more or less says it's now or never. There really isn't a lot of other options and he is not as prepared as he wanted to be I mean, Spassky isn't playing blind. He's not stupid. He's, he understands this has to happen. He just wanted to be better prepared for it, and he couldn't be, but he can't afford to not do it now.
So he does it with a pop instead of a bang. So that, that's basically the gist of this. Instead, now instead, because of his choice of putting the bishop here, now instead of taking the outpost, Karpov just takes the bishop. One defender down is how he's going to look at this. And it's an exchange, so it's not like, it's not like Karpov gained a piece, but it's still a very necessary defender down. Now watch how he does this and watch why. It, and, and here's why. Um, I want to show you this. This is really kind of cool, if I can do this right. He took the bishop with the knight. Now, if, Ka or if uh, Spassky takes it with the knight instead, then what happens is Karpov goes like that, and that is thunder against Black's position. And, and again... There are quite a few variations. Perhaps someone like Juzunim can analyze these and talk to us about it in the comment section. I'm not going to take the time because I have to keep these videos relatively at about a half an hour. So, but this really helps Karpov, according to Kasparov. So that's why, that's why Spassky did not retake with the knight, he retook with the pawn. But what that means is, of course, there's not going to be any kind of a queenside attack. So, in essence, uh, Karpov has made more strong moves than Spassky. And Spassky, at this point, is the only player who has made two. One real dubious move and a weak move. So, a dubious move and a weak move on Spass or, yeah, Spassky's part... Karpov has not had any of that problem. So at this point, uh, White's position is looking pretty good. It is, uh, they'll comment here on just another moment. Uh, so he did retake with the pawn, and now his pawn takes the e5. So he is going to begin giving himself control of the e5, or giving up e5 altogether. He lets... Spassky occupy e5, but at this point, because of the setup, it doesn't help him. And you go, then what's the point of this blabbering about e5? Because it's important to see, because of a dubious excursion, he lost the chance to have control of e5. Yes, he occupies it. It doesn't mean a thing. Why? Why? This is a subtle chess lesson. And Karpov will show us this. But by retaking with the pawn, yes, he occupies e5, but he gave Karpov the file. The D file. Open file. Man, how much have I raved about that in my videos. Let's keep watching. This is really wonderful. Exchanging the queens... Uh, is not nearly as good at this point. Karpov realizes I can get control of the D file, so I don't need to exchange queens. Karpov's position is what is called a freer position. He has more options, and so one of Steinitz's old chess rules... Now, you know, we're talking chess from 1880s and 1890s. Steinitz, the first world chess champion, he said if you have the freer position, it is strategically more sound to keep your pieces on the board. To exchange just for the sake of exchanging isn't as good. And so Karpov retains the queen. He'll keep the queens. He's not going to exchange. And now he goes to queen c8, and that's a uh, question mark and exclamation point. That's another... It, it's somewhat provocative, but not very good. And now White's position... Uh, Kasparov says White's position is looking really attractive. Now he's got it to where... See, now e5 disappears. 
at first, because of the way the beginning uh, opened up, e5 was the key. Now at this point, because of the way it's been played, don't worry about e5 anymore, now it moves to a different strategy, open files. One of my favorites. This gave him, this move gave Karpov a very good pawn move. Essentially, now this is the second, not a blunder, it's, it's just, it, it's not the best move, but this is the second one in this game that Spassky has made, and in each instance, Karpov has made excellent moves. So, this is not looking good for Spassky. He's going to bring his knight back, and now he's got an outpost, and he's got a good pin on the knight against the queen, right? For now, just recognize he's got the pin. It's not permanent, and it's not devastating, and it's not positively horrible, and it's not going to win the game, but it is a pin. So that changes what Spassky can do. And there is his second blunder. Man, he pushed the H5 and that... No. No! That seriously weakened the king's position. And now Karpov is happy. He says, oh, well, I'll exchange him. Not a bad point. Now, just a moment ago, and then you're probably thinking, now, well, wait a minute, you're contradicting yourself because you just said you don't want to exchange pieces, the Steinitz rule. You don't want to exchange pieces if you have the freer position. And it just looks like, because of the way Karpov moved and Spassky's response, that now Karpov is starting to exchange pieces. But in the exchange of pieces, it is because... Spassky's position has weakened. So he's not just idly exchanging pieces. There has been a move forward for Karpov in that now Spassky has a weaker position and it's okay to exchange that piece. You see what I mean? Yeah. The rules, you know, they're not set in concrete, you guys. They're not just there to follow lock, stock, and barrel. We have to learn, and this takes a lot of practice, but we have to learn to be flexible and adaptable and be able to read the board like Jeremy Silman says, and I've talked about eternally, which is very vital, and Yusupov says. Now you have to adapt because now it's different. And because of the weakening of the position, yes, now your strategy can change. Again, the, the open strategy... Now, if you're still thinking in concrete terms, well, E5, E5, I have to take that pawn off of E5 and control... No, you've missed the whole point. Because of the way the position has changed, the E5 significance has disappeared, and now something else has taken a place. Yes, you had a freer position, so you don't exchange the queens yet, but now he's brought in a huge weakness, so you do exchange a piece. See, it's, you have to adapt. You have to be open to, oh, hey, wait a minute. That move changes my strategy. That move changes my focus on which square I need to attack or else which piece I need to put in a certain area, right? So flexibility with a concrete knowledge of the general rules, you can apply them as they apply, but it's critical to be adaptive. Karpov became the master. Well, that's why he became the world champion, man. And he retained it for quite a while. So this is great. This is good stuff. So, and, and then the queen will take, yes, of course. The queen retakes. No kidding. Now, when you, uh, who was it, Lasker? He said, when you see a good move, <laughs> that's a pretty good move, take that file and challenge that queen, right? But when you see a good move, sit on your hands and look and see if you can find a better move. 
Wasn't that one of Lasker's dictums? Look at the prominent centralization of that queen. Look how from here she didn't radiate too much influence anywhere. From here she is just a nightmare. You can see how much more of Spassky's territory that queen is hitting than from here. So this is a good move. It's a more laser beam focus into Black's territory. This is true. But this comes all the way out. You see the difference there. So he found a better move instead of just a good move. And that's always important to look for. So a cool little way that, that Karpov shows us this. Bishop to h4. Spassky is more or less reduced to uh, doing one-piece threats, right? He ignores that. He doesn't ignore it, I mean. He puts his rook on a better file than the F file. But notice who gets to dominate the files and the effects. From here out, I'm going to rant and rave about the files. Because Kasparov did. And because the game shows us that. I know earlier on, way quite a while ago, people were actually starting to complain that I was talking too much about open files. And I, I did several videos pertaining to them. Well, here's one of the reasons why... I am really glad I emphasized that earlier so that you can see its effect. Now he's got the file. The queen will go to e7. Um, she's not... She does cover the bishop, but she's... Look at the difference with the queens, right? This isn't the best position for his queen compared to Karpov. Now, this is the Silman idea of make every one of your pieces better than your opponent's. And we're beginning to see Karpov do that as well. I mean, there's so much uh, to chess, right? And now the other rook. Again, the full development, use every piece. And both of these guys do that every game they play. Yeah, you know, all the grandmasters, well, they should, but most of the grandmasters do, yeah? So now he has both files. And this isn't technically an open file. His pawn, it is a file. So, really now, Karpov is beginning to dominate. Spassky sweating bullets. Here comes Karpov. The general theme is there's no way you should ever just let your opponent have a file. You really have to challenge him. So it makes sense that he moved the rook instead of the knight. The knight has nowhere to go anyway. <coughs> so it makes sense that he made the rook move, in my opinion. And oh man, am I opinionated, right? In my opinion, this is the greatest game ever invented. So you got that. So, what would you do as Karpov at this point? Technically, you don't uh, have any real vital targets at all. You've got exquisite control of the center. Your queen is just dominating the board. Your bishop is backing up the queen with tremendous diagonals, limiting again the options because of these. And notice the dark square bishop is the one Karpov has kept. Oh, heavens, yes, because that's the one where he can come in and keep the king under lock and key, yeah? So, really, Karpov is. Tremendous. He does have a target here. It, yes, it's guarded at this point, but that square is a weakness for him. So, really, truly, Karpov has a masterpiece of a position. The question is, what do you do next? Do you have a 
fabulous queen, you have a fabulous bishop, you have fabulous rooks, your pawn structures technically don't have any weaknesses. Yes, you have an isolated pawn. It's not under attack, though. Right? What's missing in Karpov's repertoire here? The knight. The knight is not doing what it could. And this next move of Karpov really shook the rafters. And it's one of Silman's dominating lessons. And it's one of Yusupov's dominating lessons. And here is a fantastic example of when to do this. I was thrilled when I saw this. In fact, this next move is the move that determined for me that I was going to show you this game. One, because it's so fantastically interesting with so many of Silman and Yusupov's principles. But here's what he does. Knight to B1. And everybody goes, oh my gosh, what for? Because that's just been a move of development. But he's really not doing anything. Everyone else is, but the knight isn't. So the principle, put your whole army into it, even if you have to step backwards to get to a better, greener pastures elsewhere, step backwards. Don't just let the dumb horse sit there. It's a good power piece. So put him to work. Now he can't immediately get to a better square, but at least position him to the point to where he can because every one of your other pieces are doing a magnificent job. Don't let the knight be the lazy one. You're not in a hurry to try to checkmate the king. You're not in a hurry to try to swap pieces. Your position is masterful, but now make it legendary. And that's what he's going for fantastic game to show that. I can't find a better game for that. Th this is fabulous. Well, okay, so I've been ratting and raving. Sorry. Queen to b7, but that was one of the coolest parts of the whole game simply because of how he did this. He didn't lose any time whatsoever. He did not lose the initiative at all. That's why the move makes perfect sense. Yeah? So keep your eye out for something like that when you're playing your chess game. And that doesn't mean every single chess game you have to do a backward move with your knight. But in this instance, that was perfect to illustrate that. And now it's time to tuck the king. Get him off the back rank. And what does that tell you somewhat? And, and now uh, Spassky puts his king up too. Get off the back rank. What they're saying is, I'm going to use my rooks. Look, he's got two files. There's no way he's going to keep those rooks on that rank. He wants to jump up into it. But get your king off the last rank. What that's doing is, ironically, really interestingly enough, is it's going to prevent counterplay in an endgame if it comes to that. Kind of fun, interesting, interesting way to... You know, I've always wondered that. Why? You know, in, in some games you'll just see him all of a sudden... Bump their king up for no apparent reason. Well, nothing is directly under attack except this possible exchange here. Spassky cannot afford to exchange at this point. His position is horrible. So he's not going to exchange. Again, indicating to us Karpov has the initiative. He can go ahead and leave his piece threatened. He's not worried about that. Better place your king. Yeah. Now, every single piece is active. And you go, wait, that knight on B1 is not active. Watch. Just watch. Just watch. Now, here's something else remarkably interesting. And I wanted to show you this. Here we go. What did I tell you earlier? That's not an eternal outpost. So, chase the knight away. This demonstrates with good proof 
that those two moves on the queen side were positively a waste of time. That was a strategic blunder, and there's nothing Spask can do except go to the edge. Now look at the board. Look at that position, you guys. There's very precious little protecting Black's king, isn't there? Isn't that outrageous? The great Boris Spassky has left his king almost stark raving naked against one of the strongest grandmasters on the planet. <laughs> but he was up and coming, so no one really knew that yet. But Karpov has all kinds of ways, not there yet, to get that king in trouble. He's almost poised for a kingside, but he's still missing his knight. And don't kid yourself, he puts him to work. But isn't that astounding? everything's over there except for one lone bishop who is limited on the side instead of being out in the middle. The center is completely Karpov's. That's a Nimzovich principle. So this, this is trouble for Spassky. Rook e2. He doesn't have to exchange at all keep the rook, actually. And you go, what in the... He gives up the open file? Temporarily, yes, because he's going to put this knight to work, and the best way to get him back in the game is through the d2 square. Clever, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking that is really cool. And then rook f8, and Kasparov is doing a face palm. He's going, holy nightmare, Batman. Um... He shouldn't, Spassky should not show so much nonchalant disdain for that D file. That is a serious uh, positional gem in your crown if you can hang on to it. And, well, Karpov moved off, so I don't need to... What he's tempting to do, see, his king's... <laughs> Spassky's in a tough spot, you know. Nothing he does in his position is really going to help him. And now the final piece into the assault comes. And now the... Yeah, bishop to d8. Look, uh, Spassky can see that Karpov is gearing... He has seen Karpov go back there, and it probably raised his eyebrows. But now that he's coming to d2, and now potentially either to here, move the queen and put it here, or right here to f3 and up and into the king's side, hey, that's got to be the square he's heading for. Spassky can see that, don't kid yourself, and he's realizing, oh my, I've got to regroup now too. My bishop way out here, and my rook, no, I've... My knight over here is positively horrible, so Spassky's going to try to hurry and regroup. Get everything back into play, because he's just been scattered to the four winds, right? I know, enough talk, show us the game. I am, and part of the joy of showing you this game is to illustrate extensively what they're both doing, because that's the lesson. The checkmate isn't the lesson. The process the setup, the positioning, the strategies and tactics. That's the lesson. And it's a beauty. And sure enough, knight f3. Okay, so in, in three quick moves, one, two, three. Now look where that knight is. A much more useful, one, a much more useful side of the board, but two, much more useful than just sitting there doing nothing. Because he couldn't get into the battle here because of the pawn. But now that we've done this, now look at what he can do. Hey, ay, ay, mama de mia. Spassky's in trouble, right? Okay, and, yeah. Spassky can see it. He's going, okay, crap. I really, really, really... He finally gets to where he's attacking the e-pawn, and he has to defend it. You've got to keep... Look, there's nothing much around the king. Although now, 
Now other pieces can start shuffling in here to protect the king, right? So he's not quite so direly placed, but, but you got to put your pawns into play now. And what you're doing is you're getting pawns against pieces, and that never wins, right? But you have to try. File work. Now go back to the file, because that's the way into Spassky's position. So jump back. Look, it accomplished its goal. Now that your knight is much better placed, jump right back and get that open file. That is the correct strategy. Now, every one of Karpov's pieces is better placed than Spassky's. I want to point that out to you. Every single piece his queen is vastly superior to the queen. The bishop is vastly superior to the bishop. You think I'm kidding. You just look at that diagonal. The rook is vastly superior to either one of those rooks. So is that rook. And the knight is superbly placed compared to this knight who is off in the Lost River range. He doesn't know where he's going. Learning to read the position of the board is very helpful. What a spectacular game by, well, both players, but Karpov's, Karpov's playing this superior game, make no mistake about it. Well, he doesn't want to lose his bishop. Blam. Because the position is superior, and now because he took his time to get every piece optimally placed, now he gets the breakthrough. And that is the break-in. That is the move. Bot Binnick gave that one an exclamation point. He said, now the game is over. The game is lost for Spassky. That's the winning move right there. That's the one that decides the game, I'll put it that way. Well, now again, notice, look, they're putting every piece into the game, right? Uh, it's just that Spassky, because of his position... Karpov having the freer position, and he did not exchange uselessly. Every exchange he's made has had a purpose, but now he's got all of his focus here, so Spassky can now finally begin getting a much stronger focus. He does bring every piece into the game. Misplaced as most of them have been, at least they're getting there. Yeah, that's important to see. And now just, yeah... Oh, well, take it. Take it, get rid of it. His position is superior. He's going to challenge the file. Heaven just take it. Don't let him sit there. Take it. The bishop will retake. Once again, this file is not so useful. But this one is absolutely sweet cream cheese, baby. Rook to d1. And now, finally... There's nothing else Spassky can do, but notice his effort, at least. Yeah, he's too little too late, but his effort is to get every piece involved. That's his effort. He doesn't just focus on a one or two piece defense. He must try as best he can to get every piece here. Back into the game. That's what he's trying to do. And now the grand centralization because his position was so good and because every one of his pieces was superior to Spassky's, now he can begin to centrally control the whole board. A great lesson. Man, there's so many things in this game. Watch this video 10 or 15 times. There's just so much in this game that is worth knowing. Really, truly. Fantastic game. Uh, and now rook eight. Rook to h8, I mean. And now rook takes d8. And it is here. Because of his absolutely superb power and position, it is here that Spassky resigned. And you go, well, now, wait a minute. Hold on. Why wouldn't you take the rook, though? because of that. And that's the end. <laughs> there, there is no way you can jump out of that. So, anyway, 
That is a wonderful game of Karpov. Now, I know this through my videos. I have neglected Anatoly Karpov's games a little bit, and I apologize to Anatoly Karpov uh, and to you because they are loaded with material. But then, on the other hand, so are Jeremy Silmans, so are Arthur Yusupovs, so are Alexander Alekins, so are Aaron Nimzoviches, so are Bobby Fishers, so are Gary Kasparovs, so is Magnus Carlsons, so is Susan Polgars. I mean, you guys, there's an absolutely overwhelming mountain of fantastic chess games to show. I can only do those one at a time, and I'm honestly trying, so... Thanks for watching my chess videos. You be safe. Be wise. We really are living in dangerous times. Don't let a few impatient, squawking minorities of groups of people control your destiny. They want to go out and get sick with COVID. That's fine. Social distancing is the key. Truly, in this day and age. So... Be safe, do well, have fun, be good, and come back for the next video. I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.